Chapter 5. 14. Counting Reckoning. Chapter 15. War of Words. Mikhail Gorbachev finally broke his public silence on May the 14th, 18 days after the disaster. Good evening, comrades, he said, beginning his televised address to the country. You all know that misfortune has recently befallen us. He did not address his fellow citizens as brothers and sisters, as Joseph Stalin had when Germany had invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, but by speaking of us, he tried to invoke a spirit of trust and solidarity between the rulers and the ruled that, if it had ever existed in Soviet times, had been shattered by his government's handling of information on the Chernobyl disaster. Gorbachev clearly did not believe that telling the truth was the best way of governing. For the first time we actually encountered a force as menacing as nuclear energy out of control, he said, maintaining the official silence on the 1957 catastrophe in Ozersk. Gorbachev was, however, completely honest in assuring viewers that the authorities were doing everything in their power to deal with the disaster and that work was going on around the clock. He also provided the most accurate figures he had at the time on the number of people directly affected by the accident. 299 men and women diagnosed with radiation sickness, with the death toll rising from two to seven. He mentioned the names of the first two who had died on the first day, but not the names of those who had died in the Moscow and Kiev hospitals in the first weeks of May. Gorbachev claimed that every effort had been made to evacuate people from affected areas as quickly as possible. As soon as we received reliable information from primary sources, it was made available to the Soviet people and sent to governments of foreign countries through diplomatic channels, he asserted. That would become his and his government's defense from then on. What might be considered reliable information was, of course, a matter of opinion. There was clear disagreement about it between Gorbachev, on the one hand, and the citizens of Pripyat and Kiev and foreign governments, on the other. More than half of Gorbachev's first address to the country on the Chernobyl disaster was dedicated to polemics with and attacks on the West. The ruling circles of the USA and their most zealous allies among them, I would mention the Federal Republic of Germany in particular, perceived in the event nothing but a further opportunity to raise additional barriers to the development and deepening of the dialogue between East and West, which was already proceeding with difficulty, and to justify the nuclear arms race, complained Gorbachev. As if that were not enough, an effort was made to show the world that negotiations, to say nothing of agreements with the USSR, are impossible in general, thereby giving the green light to further preparations for war. Gorbachev was reacting to the wave of indignation and criticism that had rocked Central and Western European countries and eventually reached the United States as a result of the initial Soviet refusal and subsequent reluctance to share information on the occurrence and consequences of the disaster. As news of the radioactive cloud moving beyond the Soviet Union reached the European public, politicians and ordinary citizens alike began sounding the alarm about immediate and long-term consequences. The reaction was strongest in West Germany, where the foreign minister, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, demanded the closure of all Soviet nuclear reactors. The Italians refused to receive Soviet ships in their ports if they were carrying any cargo originating in Ukraine but a country's politics and the importance of nuclear power in its economy influenced the reaction. In France, where most of the electricity was produced by nuclear plants, the government was in denial, refusing to acknowledge that the radioactive Chernobyl cloud had ever entered French airspace. In Britain, where the cloud went after floating through France, there was no attempt to deny or hide its presence. In the communist countries of Eastern Europe, Government officials were silent, but the people were not. That the Soviets said nothing and let our children suffer exposure to this cloud for days is unforgivable, Time magazine quoted a Polish citizen as saying. In the United States, which was not directly affected by the Chernobyl disaster, 
but had the greatest stake in maintaining the international order and information exchange on nuclear energy accidents, President Ronald Reagan, then in the second term of his presidency and at the peak of his popularity, expressed his sympathies to those affected by the disaster in a May the 4th radio address to the nation. We stand ready, as do many nations, to assist in any way we can, said Reagan, who then proceeded to attack the Soviets for their secrecy and stubborn refusal to inform the international community of the common danger from this disaster. He continued, The Soviets' handling of this incident manifests a disregard for the legitimate concerns of people everywhere. A nuclear accident that results in contaminating a number of countries with radioactive material is not simply an internal matter. The Soviets owe the world an explanation. A full accounting of what happened at Chernobyl and what is happening now is the least the world community has a right to expect. That was the first time President Reagan, or any other Western leader for that matter, expressed criticism of the Soviet handling of the Chernobyl disaster. When asked by journalists soon after his radio address about his critical remarks, Reagan responded, Hasn't that been rather their way about many things in their own country? They are a little mistrustful of all of us. For Reagan, a seasoned Cold War warrior, his remarks on the Soviet system were mild indeed, but they came only a few months after his promising first meeting with Gorbachev in Geneva in December 1985. The two had decided there to meet again the following year, and the media was actively discussing the possible timing of the future summit and its agenda. Gorbachev, addressing the Communist Party Congress in February 1986, had spoken not only of American imperialism, but also of the new interdependence of the great powers, and now Chernobyl, or more precisely the Soviet handling of the disaster and the American reaction to it, were threatening to derail the normalization of relations between the two superpowers. On May the 5th, the leaders of the Group of Seven, G7, the most advanced democratic economies, including Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom and the United States, meeting in Tokyo, issued a joint statement on the Chernobyl accident that largely followed the line taken by Reagan the previous day. They expressed sympathy for those who had died or been affected by the disaster, but they also noted their responsibility as nuclear states to inform their neighbours about nuclear accidents, especially those with trans-border consequences, and made a similar request of the USSR. They welcomed the news that the Soviet government had begun to cooperate with the Vienna-based International Atomic Energy Agency, which was charged with promoting cooperation in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. But they also demanded more openness and cooperation. We urge the government of the Soviet Union, which did not do so in the case of Chernobyl, to provide urgently such information as our and other countries have requested, read the statement. The outside world was eager to get as much information as possible. Between April the 27th and May the 16th, there were 22 visits of foreign diplomats to Kiev, unprecedented attention to a city that had only a few consulates, and those only of Eastern European communist countries. The KGB worked hard to prevent foreign diplomats and journalists from acquiring any non-official information about the accident. Foreign correspondents' phone calls were monitored, and reporters stationed in Moscow began to experience technical problems in wiring their stories from the Soviet capital. Soviet officials blamed what they called an anti-Soviet campaign on warmongers in Western governments and Ukrainian nationalists abroad, who were allegedly lobbying the US Congress for increased pressure on the Soviet government to release more information to its own people and the world. On April the 30th, foreign ambassadors had been summoned for a briefing at the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow. Deputy Foreign Minister Anatoly Kovalyov provided casualty figures, but generally downplayed the danger presented by the release of radioactivity. It was a hard sell. The meeting lasted until 2.30 a.m. on May the 1st. Kovalyov then issued instructions to the foreign ministers of the Soviet republics on how to handle the growing crisis.
the local authorities were to explain to concerned foreigners that the accident posed no danger to their health, but if the foreigners wanted to leave anyway, they should be allowed to do so. Their requests for medical checkups were to be met immediately, but anyone diagnosed with symptoms of radiation sickness would have to stay in the country. As the Ukrainian foreign minister summarized Kovalyov's instructions, the task is to prevent people who have fallen ill from leaving the country so as not to allow our enemies to exploit chance incidents for anti-Soviet purposes. Kovalyov's assurances to the foreign ambassadors did not have the desired effect. The British withdrew 100 of their students from Kiev and Minsk, the capital of neighboring Belarus. The Finns evacuated their students from Kiev. A total of 87 language students from the United States and Britain left Kiev, as did 16 Canadians, whom the KGB failed to persuade that the Soviet government was not hiding the truth from them. Students from developing countries, alerted by the exodus of their wealthier classmates, claimed that they were being discriminated against and demanded that their embassies evacuate them as well. Students from Nigeria, India, Egypt, Iraq and other countries took a vote and decided to leave Kiev before the end of the academic year. The KGB reported that some of them simply wanted a free ticket home, longer vacations and lenient treatment in early exams. One way or another, they were leaving. In late April, a group of American tourists in Kiev, alarmed by news of the accident, tried to get airplane tickets to Leningrad in order to leave Ukraine as soon as possible. The head of the Ukrainian KGB reported to the Ukrainian party boss, Volodymyr Chichirbitsky, that his agents had managed to normalize the situation, meaning to postpone the group's departure. A group of 14 Canadians insisted on leaving the country immediately, claiming that the Soviet media was concealing the actual situation. The KGB was working on that group as well, the goal being to convince the foreigners, and through them, governments and public opinion in the West, that nothing extraordinary had happened in the Soviet Union. While foreign students and visitors already in Kiev began to leave, others who had planned to visit the city refused to come. Tourism companies were cancelling trips to Kiev, whereas in May 1985 the city had hosted up to a thousand tourists per day from capitalist countries. In the first weeks of May 1986, the KGB counted no more than 150. Bicyclists from the United States, Britain, Norway, and most other Western countries refused to come to Kiev for the May the 6th start of an international bicycling competition. In an attempt to convince viewers that the situation was normal and under control, Soviet television showed Soviet bicyclists and their colleagues from communist countries riding through the streets of Kiev. The same footage clearly showed, however, that the streets of Kiev, which should have been full of people welcoming the athletes and cheering for their team, were empty. Mikhail Gorbachev, always sensitive about his image abroad, was watching the rising wave of Western criticism of him and his government with great concern. He even complained to academician Valery Legasov that his name was being taken in vain in the West. Something had to be done, and done quickly. On May the 6th, as radioactivity from the Chernobyl reactor began to decline after the unexpected increase of the previous few days, the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs hosted a press conference to discuss the accident. The Deputy Foreign Minister, Kovalyev, who had met with foreign ambassadors a few days earlier, was in charge. He pushed the traditional Cold War line, attacking the United States for organizing a campaign of hysteria. But there was also a new voice at the press conference, that of the first head of the Chernobyl State Commission, Boris Chichermina, freshly arrived from Pripyat. He admitted that the radiation levels had previously been underestimated and that the evacuation of civilians had been delayed. Soviet journalists and their colleagues from the socialist camp were allowed to ask questions on the spot, while Western reporters had to submit theirs in advance. The Westerners were disappointed, but the Soviet government had finally begun to speak truthfully to its people and the world.
On the same day, Pravda published an article explaining that the explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear plant on April the 26th had caused a large fire. The paper's journalists described the heroic struggle of the firefighters who had extinguished the blaze. In a measured attempt to provide more information on the consequences of the disaster, the Soviet news agency, TASS, reported on the spread of radioactivity beyond the exclusion zone into Ukraine and Belarus, and the threat that it might contaminate the Dnieper River. But the Soviet media did not only inform, it also attacked, its target being the West, whose indignation had forced the Soviet government to break its silence on the rising radiation level. It is to be regretted, however, that against the broad background of sympathy and understanding, particular circles are trying to exploit what has happened for unseemly political purposes, read the TASS statement. Rumours and speculations that run counter to elementary moral standards are being circulated as propaganda. For example, nonsensical exaggerations are being spread about thousands of dead and panic among the population. The Soviets were referring to unverified Western reports on the number of victims published in the first days after the accident, their goal being to discredit the requests of Western governments and journalists for more information. The Soviets were talking, but they were also trying to save face. Around the same time, after days of stonewalling, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow finally allowed a select group of foreign journalists, including Westerners, to visit Kiev, and then the site of the Chernobyl disaster. The Ukrainian Chernobyl Commission discussed the coming visit at its meeting of May the 5th. Orders were given to prepare the venues and instruct those people who would be speaking with foreign journalists. The latter task was entrusted to the head of the party propaganda department and the future president of Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk. It was assumed that the journalists would want to visit hospitals and areas undergoing decontamination. Apart from the regime of secrecy, an issue of pride was involved for those charged with hosting the foreigners. We have to start with hospital wear, which is unsightly, starting with bed linen, remarked the party boss of the Kiev region, Krirori Revenko. The deputy head of the Ukrainian government, Yevhen Kajovlovsky, assured those attending the preparatory meeting that he could sign the order to provide additional supplies of new sheets and bed linen. The authorities were not eager to show visitors the actual state of Soviet hospitals and the standard of living in the communist superpower. The hospitals received new linens and were ready by May the 8th, but the need for window dressing did not end there. The KGB was especially concerned about long lines at railroad ticket offices. Kievans were leaving the city en masse. They, foreign journalists, will go to the ticket offices first and foremost and release information that we can do without, said the head of the Ukrainian KGB, Stepan Mucha, to the commission. He informed his colleagues that of twenty reporters descending on the city that day, half were from capitalist countries. Ukrainian officials promised to shorten lines by opening new ticket offices, a move that helped confuse reporters. A New York Times article of May the 9th claimed that Kievans were leaving their city by the hundreds. In fact, they were leaving by the tens of thousands. Reporters visiting Kiev on the evening of May the 8th noticed a heavy police presence on the streets, but otherwise no signs of panic. Kievans were still strolling about, and some were even fishing in the Dnieper. This was a far cry from the unverified reports about thousands of people killed or severely injured by the explosion. Premier Oleksandr Lyashko, who addressed the journalists, could not resist scoring a point in the propaganda war. He asked the reporter who had written a panicky story about the consequences of the accident to rise, he probably had in mind Luther Whittington, a United Press International reporter who had obtained erroneous information from a female resident of Kiev whom he had met a few weeks earlier in Moscow. Some of his colleagues believed that Whittington, whose Russian was shaky at best, never understood his source properly and got her story wrong. One way or another, however, Whittington was not in Kiev.
He spread dirt and went into hiding, commented Lyashko. He read an excerpt from the erroneous report. The correspondents were considerably embarrassed, as was apparent from the murmur that swept through the room, recalled Lyashko, feeling good about the whole experience. On May the 8th, the day the foreign journalists arrived in Kiev, Hans Blix, the former Swedish foreign minister and now director general of the Vienna-based International Atomic Energy Agency, visited the Chernobyl nuclear plant, a sign of the new openness the Soviets were demonstrating. In the company of academician Yevgeny Velikov, Blix and his American nuclear security advisor, Maurice Rosen, took a helicopter flight from Kiev to Chernobyl, observing the area around the damaged reactor. Blix's visit to Chernobyl presented the Soviets, who had sent him an official invitation on May the 4th, with a number of challenges. The Soviets wanted Blix in Chernobyl to calm Western public opinion by showing that the original reports and fears had been exaggerated, and that every effort was being made to contain the damage caused by the explosion. But how could that be accomplished when the top Soviet experts themselves still did not know what had caused the explosion, or what was to be expected of the unruly reactor, which kept heating up or cooling down in seemingly arbitrary fashion? When Blix's visit was being planned, Velikov had suggested that bringing him to Chernobyl by car was a bad idea, as toilet facilities at the power plant and apparently along the road, although he did not mention that, were in disrepair, which would reflect badly on the hosts. In actual fact, Velikov was afraid that on the road to Chernobyl, Blix and his party would meet with clouds of radioactive dust, which would show up on his Geiger counter and defeat the whole purpose of the visit. He suggested a helicopter flight, but that raised an additional set of problems. A few miles from the Chernobyl power plant, the Soviets had built a huge radar system, called Duga, or Arch, in the mid-1970s. It was one of two installations that made up the core of the Soviet anti-ballistic missile early warning system. The radar required a large supply of electricity to operate and was linked by a secret electric cable to the Chernobyl nuclear plant. The radar had been built to detect NATO missile launches. Another similar installation was located near Komsomolsk on the Amur River in the Soviet Far East to monitor the American West Coast. The Chernobyl accident rendered the first installation inoperable because the military unit that operated the Duga in the compound called Chernobyl II shut it down as levels of radioactivity began to rise during the first hours after the explosion. But the huge radar apparatus, which American experts called steel works, remained plainly visible from the air. There was no way to observe the nuclear plant from a helicopter without seeing the top-secret radar system. The Soviets had to choose whether to show Blix the toilet facilities and hide the super-secret radar, or vice versa. According to Velikov, Gorbachev personally ruled on the issue, allowing the helicopter inspection. The decision eliminated the possibility that radioactive dust absorbed by Blix on the way to Chernobyl and measurements taken at the nuclear plant would allow him and his experts to comprehend the true scope of the disaster. That would contradict what the Soviets were telling the world, that the radioactive emissions from the reactor had stopped, and that the remaining radiation levels were being caused by the debris that had been dispersed by the original explosion. As the Soviet authorities were well aware, this half-truth amounted to a lie. It is not clear whether Blix and his companions noticed the Duga radar system when they took their helicopter flight, but Blix did see smoke coming from the reactor, an indication that graphite elements were still burning. Velikov recalled that Blix's nuclear security expert, Rosen, lacked the equipment required to measure high radiation levels, and when asked whether he wanted to get closer to the reactor, responded in the negative. Blix reported that inside the helicopter cabin, at a height of 400 meters and a distance of 800 meters from the reactor, his dosimeters showed a radiation level of 350 milliroentgens per hour. The team members did not measure radiation levels outside the relatively safe haven of the helicopter, 
nor did they visit the power plant itself. Instead, they landed in the relatively safe part of Chernobyl, as opposed to the heavily contaminated Pripyat, and then flew back to Kiev. Except for the smoke, the situation looked quite good from the helicopter. In general, the station was in one piece. Somebody was stirring down below, and there was no trace of any tens of thousands of corpses, recalled Velikov. At the subsequent press conference in Moscow, Blix was, if anything, optimistic about the future of the area affected by the disaster. We were able to see people working in the fields, livestock in the pastures, and cars driving in the streets, he told the journalists. The Russians are confident that they will be able to clean up the area. It will be available for agriculture once again. Blix proposed to convene an international conference in Vienna that would look into the causes of the disaster and ways of avoiding them in the future. He assured the audience that the China Syndrome, or the poisoning of underground waters and the world's oceans, was not a threat, and Rosen concluded that there had been no meltdown of the reactor. In an interview with a Soviet reporter in Vienna, Rosen would later estimate the radiation level that he measured during the helicopter flight at 10 millirem. That is no great amount of radioactivity, he allegedly said. It is equivalent, for example, to the dose of radioactivity received by an airline passenger in the course of two trips from Europe to the United States. Blix's visit to Chernobyl gave the Soviets their first victory in the propaganda war with the West. On May the 9th, one day after Blix's visit to Chernobyl, Pravda published an article by the leading Soviet expert on international affairs, the director of the Institute of the USA and Canada, Georgi Arbatov, who stated that the West was not united in its criticism of the Soviet Union. There were good and bad guys. The good ones, who were truly compassionate and wanted to help, included Dr. Robert Peter Gale, an American bone marrow transplant expert, who had flown to Moscow on May the 2nd to operate on accident victims, and his colleague, Dr. Paul Tarasaki. The opposite camp was represented by unnamed practitioners of psychological warfare against the Soviet Union, who were allegedly afraid of Soviet peace initiatives, and now claimed that because the USSR had hidden information about the accident, its proposals could not be trusted. In order to make a propagandistic stir and direct it against the USSR, they have decided on an obvious exaggeration, portraying a serious but obviously local accident as a global nuclear disaster, wrote Abatov. When Gorbachev addressed his country and the world in his first and last Chernobyl speech on May the 14th, he picked up and developed many of Arbatov's points. Like Arbatov, he thanked doctors Gale and Tarasaki. He also mentioned the objectivity shown by Hans Blix, but condemned the unbridled anti-Soviet campaign unleashed in the West, especially in the United States and West Germany. He attacked the statement issued in Tokyo by the leaders of the G7 countries and laid out plans for increasing the role of the agency led by Blix, and he promised that a full report on the accident would be presented to the conference that was to be organized by Blix's agency. He also called on Ronald Reagan to meet with him, possibly in Hiroshima, to sign a treaty banning nuclear tests. Gorbachev was eager to turn the tables on the Americans by throwing Hiroshima into the debate over the handling of Chernobyl. Whatever the outcome of Gorbachev's counteroffensive in the West, at home his speech scored him very few political points. His interpreter, Pavel Palitschenko, who watched Gorbachev's address, admitted that he was in a difficult position, trying not to downplay the disaster while saying nothing that might arouse panic. The result was anything but the one desired by Gorbachev and his speechwriters. Moscow was close to panic, recalled Palazhenko. The city was rife with rumors, and few people believed the official version of events. Government-run media was minimizing the disaster, both out of habit and fear of causing even greater panic. But the mood in Moscow was gloom and often anger. It was a mood of distrust of the authorities. In retrospect, I think it, Gorbachev's address, caused a rift between the people and the government that never closed. If Gorbachev was distrusted in Moscow, 
In Kiev, people were angry, and many believed that it was the end of his career, which had begun with such promise. Among other things, distressed Kievans resorted to black humor. Velikhov, who had figured prominently in the Blix propaganda coup, was greeted in Kiev by Ukrainian colleagues with a new joke. A Chernobyl man and a Kievan meet in heaven. What brought you here? asked the Kievan. Radiation, answers the Chernobyl man. And what about you? Information, responds the Kievan. Gorbachev was denying information not only to the world, but also to his own people, as they knew better than anyone else, partly because of Western broadcasts. But Gorbachev would not give up. On the day after his television address, he met with Dr. Robert Peter Gale, whom he had praised in his speech, and the prominent American businessman Armand Hammer, a champion of improved relations with the USSR, who delivered American medication for the victims of Chernobyl. Hammer had begun his business dealings with the Soviets in the days of Vladimir Lenin, and had actually met the founder of the Soviet state, a detail never lost on the Soviet media. Now the Soviets reported that Hammer had asked Gorbachev about the possibility of a summit meeting with Reagan, which had been discussed during their first meeting in Geneva in December 1985. Gorbachev said that he was interested in a summit on two conditions. It would have to yield tangible results, and the political atmosphere would have to be right. Soviet reporting left no doubt that political atmosphere meant the end of what Gorbachev had called vicious anti-Soviet propaganda in his address. The West was supposed to stop questioning his government's treatment of the Chernobyl accident. On May the 15th, the day of his meeting with Gorbachev, Robert Peter Gale gave a press conference at which he provided figures of actual and potential victims of the disaster that dwarfed those cited by Soviet authorities, including Gorbachev himself. Gale followed Gorbachev in saying that nine people had died up to that point, while 299 individuals were currently hospitalized with different degrees of radiation sickness. But he had other figures as well. Thirty-five people were in critical condition, according to Gale, and he and his team had operated on nineteen of them. The American doctor predicted that the number of those affected by radiation poisoning might reach 50,000 to 60,000. He appealed for more drugs and equipment on top of those already brought to Moscow by Hammer. He was joined at the press conference by a Soviet colleague and announced their agreement to conduct joint research and produce a joint publication on the results of their work. The press conference was a propaganda success for the Soviets. They had shown the world, including those most affected by the disaster, that they were open and had nothing to hide. The actual outcome of Dr. Gale's efforts to help the Chernobyl victims was harder to assess. Before the end of the month, Gale gave another press conference in Moscow, stating that the death toll now stood at 23. More disturbing for Gale and the American-Soviet cooperation effort was a statement by the Soviet Deputy Minister of Health, academician Yevgeny Chazov, who said that 11 of the bone marrow transplant patients had died. Later, the leading Soviet radiation sickness expert, Dr. Angelina Guskova, stated that bone marrow transplants were doing more harm than good. Gale had assisted with those surgeries, and he was now fighting for his reputation. A marrow transplant can only prevent you from dying of bone marrow failure. It cannot prevent you dying from burns or radiation damage to the liver he argued. Gale estimated the success of his operations at 90%. This and similar statements of his were met with skepticism both in the Soviet Union and in his own country, but all that would come later. Whatever the practical outcome of his operations, at the critical moment in the East-West propaganda war over Chernobyl, Dr. Gale showed the Soviets that the Americans were there to render assistance while helping the Soviets change the tone of the Chernobyl discussions in the international arena. At the time, Gale was a messenger of hope in a world divided by Cold War rivalries. Soviet leaders were surprised by the international reaction to their cover-up of the accident and its consequences in the first hours, days and weeks after it took place. 
In the United States, President Reagan created a special presidential task force on Chernobyl, and the White House press secretary, Larry Speaks, reported almost daily on its findings. Members of the administration attacked the Soviet government for its failure to release information in a timely manner. Legitimate environmental and health concerns aside, the West was ready and even eager to engage in a new propaganda battle with the Soviet Union. Economic issues generate nothing but yawns at home, stated a Reagan administration official who helped draft the radio address in which the president first raised the Chernobyl issue, almost two weeks ahead of Gorbachev. The Soviets fought back, trying to regain control of the Chernobyl narrative, the politically all-important story of who knew what and when and what had been done about it. Cold War rhetoric served the Soviet regime well in its early attempts to mobilize the population and distract it from internal problems and economic hardships. Close to one-third of all Soviet media coverage of the Chernobyl accident during the first month after the disaster was dedicated to attacks on the West. Soviet propagandists were happy to point out inaccuracies and exaggerations in the first Western reports on the accident, inaccuracies caused by the Soviet information blockade. Gorbachev used the occasion to push for a nuclear test ban, part of his foreign policy offensive aimed at easing international tensions and freeing the struggling Soviet economy from the burden of continuing the arms race. But in the clash of Chernobyl narratives, Soviet authorities realized that they were losing the contest and decided to loosen the grip of censorship over the Soviet press. Pressure from the West and the Soviet public's demands for accurate information had a major impact on Gorbachev's policy. Soviet journalists were suddenly granted access to people in the nuclear industry with whom they could not have hoped to speak earlier. The regime of secrecy was crumbling, and the era of glasnost, or openness, which would become a hallmark of Gorbachev's reforms only a few months later, was beginning. At the Harriman Institute for Advanced Study of the Soviet Union at Columbia University, Dr. Jonathan Sanders, who would later spend years as a CBS correspondent in Moscow, launched a new project, the Working Group on Soviet Television, using new technology to tape Soviet television broadcasts. He wrote in a conference paper that coverage of the Chernobyl disaster marked a turning point in the history of Soviet communications. For the first time, television began to meet people's demands for bad news, to abandon the silence about domestic disasters. The turning point would prove critical for the development of the Soviet media, Soviet-American relations, and the incipient collapse of the USSR. The Soviet Union was living out its final years. There would be a great deal of bad news to come, and after Chernobyl, no way for the Soviet regime to hide it from its own people and the world.